Hello, everyone. I'd like to talk to you about the anatomy of an outrageous goal. And I'd like to talk to you about more about setting outrageous goals. And I don't mean goals that are like, hey, this year I'm going to lose some weight, or this year I'm going to do this thing, or learn to play the guitar, which usually you do right before the end of the year, um, and then don't actually go through with it. But setting silly, outrageous goals that don't make any sense, that don't seem like you could ever even do them, and then, because they're so strange, actually accomplish them. So when I think of goals, I think of two things. I think of something that someone told me a while ago that stuck into my head. And what they told me was, there's a lot that you can accomplish, but usually what people do is they underestimate what you can do in five years and way overestimate what you can do in one year. So the issue is that you could say, I want to do this thing in one year, you don't have enough time, end of the year, you drop it, you get demoralized, and the feedback loop is, oh, I can't really do goals. And you see all these other people that do these great, gigantic goals. Well, I said, well, if people underestimate what you can do in five years, then let's simply um, set a goal for five years. And why not 25 goals? Why not just a bunch of goals that don't make any sense? So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I started in 2008, and now it's one month before the end of the five years of the goals that I set. So I graduated in 2008 into a giant recession um, in Portland, Oregon, in which there were really not that many jobs and no opportunities. Um, my degree was in anthropology, which is not traditionally something you get a job in right out of college. Um, and I decided that I would teach myself how to think by going to a private liberal arts college, uh, which also gives you a lot of student loans. <laughs> so as I sat there, I kind of thought, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Uh, what, what have I gotten myself into? It's, it's kind of this issue. Um, and my friend Mario, who was taking economics, said, uh, to me in like 2006, he said, well, when you graduate, it's going to be this horrible recession and it's going, you know, it's going to be the best time of your life. And I said, oh yeah, why is that? He said, well, you just need to go out and talk to everybody because when people don't have enough resources, um, they end up having to socially network with others for resources. So what you should do is just meet as many people as you can um, and just have fun. Um, and then when the economy comes back up, then you'll be able to do whatever you want. Uh, and I said, okay, sure, I'll try that. Um, so I set some goals. I set 25 goals. Um, one of them was getting a job upon graduation, but I wanted to do it in a completely different way. I wanted, to pe I wanted people to call me up and have me interview for the job, as in I was interviewing their company um, to see if, if it would be a good fit for me to join um, and do it without a resume and get you know, three of these job offers after college. Um, and then I also wanted a keynote at a large tech conference, but I had nothing to talk about. I wanted to do, <laughs> I wanted to do a TED talk, but again, I had nothing to talk about. Uh, I hadn't cured cancer, I hadn't done anything exciting. Um, and then I wanted to also start and sell a company. Um, and there were a few others on that list. And at that point in time, those all seemed completely impossible. Just, just completely absurd. Like, what, what was I doing being a college graduate? People are going to call me up and say, you need to work at my company. Yeah, right, uh, without, a, without a resume. Um, so I started uh, trying to figure out what I could do about it. And I came, kind of came up with these um, three kind of rules. One was pattern recognition, trying to figure out, you know, some people have this uh, in their lives as a normal thing. For some people, it's very normal to have people call them up and say, hey, you, you should join our company. Um, some people will invite you to speak at all sorts of different conferences. Um, and, and for those people, it's very normal. And so I said, well, I just need to go to a community where that's extremely normal. And so I did. I went to, um, I joined the Portland tech community where it was okay to start a company and it was normal. And in fact, if you didn't have a project you were working on, you were abnormal. And therefore, well, I, I guess I had to have a project and, uh, and, and network with them. Um, and then uh, again and again, you know, put in the time. I was putting in uh, 20 hours a week on my part-time job and I was putting 80 hours a week in networking with people. So I had 100 hour weeks where, because it was fun and interesting, I didn't really notice it. And I kept putting myself into these awkward, uncomfortable situations. Um, I kept thinking, okay, well, I need to go and speak at this conference, so I'll just walk right up to this guy and say, hey, I'd like to speak at your conference. And <laughs> the first time I did that, um, this man, Steve Galen, said, you know, it's really nice that you're so excited to speak at my conference. But um, the VP of Disney is speaking at this conference, and you're just this random kid out of college, like, you know. I was like, well, maybe someone will cancel, and here's my card, and just call me up. 
<laughs> so a few months later, I got the email, hey, someone dropped out of the conference. We need <laughs> okay, cool. Um, how much time do I have? He said, you have five minutes. I said, well, you know, I, my speech is a little bit longer than five minutes. Can I have 10 minutes? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, okay. And when he was introducing me on stage before I spoke, he said, you know, this reminds me of the time that I walked into Blockbuster Video and said, I need to make your website. Um, and that's how he got one of his first web design projects. So he said, I really admire that audacity. Uh, and then I gave the speech. And I gave a bad speech. Um, <laughs> And it was really important to give a bad speech because I had to put myself in the uncomfortable position of sucking at speaking. Because how are you supposed to improve unless somebody comes up to you afterwards and says, you read every single line of your slides. Don't do that. Because, you know, if, if, I, kept, if I had started with this big speech and it was a big deal, no one from the audience would have said that. They would have just sat there, eyes glazed, <laughs> and they wouldn't have told me anything. So I had to allow myself to be awful. Um, and really, the reason why I wanted to speak there is because there was a guy who was keynoting who went to MIT, and I wanted to speak at MIT before the age of 27, and that was, the, that was one of the goals on the list. <laughs> said, if I speak at this conference, even if I make a fool of myself, and even if he doesn't watch it, he might invite me to speak at MIT. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, and in a few months, hey, would you like to speak at MIT? Yes. Um, so I kept doing that again and again until I got more and more of these speaking engagements where I got a little bit better each time and each time was a little bit more challenging, like a really good math problem set. I don't know if any of you guys like doing math homework, but I was really into it. And uh, I liked leveling up very slowly um, in, in a very nice, um, very relaxing way where one problem is just a little bit harder than the next. Um, the next thing was not taking these goals too seriously. It wasn't, oh, I must do these goals, and if I don't do them, something horrible is going to happen. It was, I'm just going to do these goals, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, because they're so absurd that no one can accomplish them anyway, so it's not really a big deal if I don't do them. And so every time I had the opportunity uh, to do something, I'd say, yeah, sure. And then I'd stand in front of an audience and be terrified, and okay, well, it's all right, because I'm just going to be awkward, and I've got four more years left in my goals, and uh, no worries. <laughs> Um, <laughs> when I was little, I was really into science and math and physics, and I was always trying to build a time machine. Um, really obsessed with, I, w I would sit there at my desk in my room and wait for my future self to come visit. <laughs> because, of course, my future self was smart enough to have invented a time machine. And of all the times that you could go back in, if you had invented a time machine, why not go back to your past self? Why, why go to the age of the dinosaurs or, or, or any other exciting place? No, go back to the person that's waiting for you to screw up their life so that they don't invent a time machine, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so the future self, I realized, is the only way I can go, is forward in time. So I need to be at all times very useful to my future self. And so that's what I did. I said, even if the hours that I put in are awful, if my future self is smiling at the end of this road, then I've done the right thing. And that what, that's what kept me doing the really hard stuff and not worrying about the 100-hour weeks and not worrying about being very awkward in front of a lot of people a lot. Um, <laughs> so again, um, then, you know, that's, that's really about moving towards these kind of situations that increase your chance of goals. So if the guy that you want to, to meet is speaking at a conference and you have to get up on stage somehow, then you go up on stage and you don't get to be fearful about it. You just, there's that other goal and you have to do this in order to get to that goal. And because that leads to that goal. So just keep going and this, this should be normal after a while, and then eventually it is, and then it's not as big of a deal. Um, so finally, um, I've accomplished some interesting things, right? So I've, I've spoken at TED, I sold a company, I did all these um, things that I thought were formally impossible in 2008. Um, and then I realized after I accomplished them, the goal didn't mean anything. The goal was just the capstone that said, you had to suffer through a bunch of awkward situations to get here. And <laughs> those awkward situations made it possible for you to to do the goal, and that it was that, um, that period of time that you spent actually doing the things that led up to the goals that was the most important. And setting the goal was just putting yourself in awkward enough situations so that you had the privilege of doing more things. And so I just kept looking for awkward situations um, and, and making more and more challenging things. Um, and so finally, um, 
I'm at this point where I have achieved all the goals. So the question is, wait, what do you do? <laughs> what happens if you accomplish all the goals that you thought you definitely could not accomplish? And it was really funny that you were trying to accomplish these silly goals. Um, so that's the thing. I don't really know. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've, I've decided I'll take two years to learn the things that are really easy for other people but are really hard for me. Um, like getting along in large groups, like making things happen at a larger scale, a kind of a mini business school type thing, and then also helping a bunch of other people out that are in awkward situations that might want to do things, and trying to tell people how hard it is to have something in your mind, and then actually go and do it with a bunch of other people. Um, so really, I've just had this two-year break, and then, because it's, it's good to have a break, and then I'll have another set of ridiculous goals, which I don't even know what are going to be at this point, and that's okay, because I don't have to think about it for another two years. Um, <laughs> um, so, really, you should go forth and set some outrageous goals, and the reason that I really set them is because once you graduate from, from college, you know, your entire life as a kid is you have um, grades, and you have report cards, and you have people helping you to do what you need to do, and the minute you get out of college, you often don't have any structure. And so a lot of people don't end up doing a bunch of stuff because they just have their life written for them instead of writing their life. And I said, well, I'm really impatient and stubborn and lazy and I don't want to do any of those things, so I'm going to make my own curriculum and my own school and my own grade system. And, uh, and, and that's why I set all these outrageous goals. So if you also want to do this, you can go and set ridiculously outrageous goals and who knows, you might end up accidentally accomplishing them and uh, and then trying to figure out what to do next. So thank you so much. <laughs>